Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. Well today I thought I'd give you an idea of how easy it is to edit a web page. So this one has been up for the USA tour for quite a while which of course is now quite redundant. So I thought I'd change it a bit keep the theme to meeting Drac. So I'm putting down the various dates and times of tours that have already done. So visiting the US, visiting Canada, then of course ongoing the tours to HMS Belfast and Chatham Dockyard which are available and upcoming a little bit of a spoiler where I may be going next year then it's a matter of saving it then going to pages because you see the USA tour is still up there as the header and then you just go in and change the header description and the internal URL and it literally is that simple and that quickly the entire page has been repurposed and I might fill in a few more details about minor trips and so forth as time goes on. Then just save, check that everything's working, just go to another page, make sure that everything refreshes properly. That's the about page and then go to the splash screen and we're done. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes but you never know you might want to do it for some other reason then head over to squarespace.com forward slash drakinafel you can get a free trial and once you're ready that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain so thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show well ladies and gentlemen this month one of the two choices made by the wonderful folks over on patreon was naval darwin awards now for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept the darwin awards were started up a little while ago and their basic concept is people who managed to either shuffle themselves off this mortal coil or otherwise permanently impede their ability to reproduce thus removing them from the gene pool as effectively as if they did in fact manage to uh, depart this plane of existence by doing things that are incredibly stupid now in order to convert that over to the naval version of things would be a little bit difficult on two grounds one is that most of the people who make the really dumb decisions tend to be people back at home um so they don't tend to face immediate fatal consequences. For example, you know, deploying the Mark 14 torpedo. An awful lot of sailors lost their lives as a result of it. None of them were the people responsible for designing the thing. And even when you're out at sea, well, even then, a lot of the people who make the dumb decisions usually don't end up paying the price for it. So rather than sticking with the exact definition of a Darwin Award as applies to naval things, I thought I'd go with the spirit of a naval Darwin Award, i.e. someone who manages to cause huge amounts of distress and trouble for their home nation by doing something absolutely incredibly dumb. So in no particular order, first we're going to introduce you to Admiral Won Gyun, at least I think that's how it's pronounced. Now most of you will probably have never heard of him before, but you will have heard of his much more famous contemporary, Admiral Yi, um, who has a much more complicated name that I'm not going to try pronouncing at this point, but you know, Admiral Yi of the Korean Navy. Now what is Admiral Yi famous for? Well he's famous for taking the turtle ships of the Korean Navy and managing to fight a series of actions against a much, much larger Japanese fleet and defeating them at pretty much all turns, despite, as I said, being horribly outnumbered. Now, the Japanese, realising that this was something of a crimp in their plans to invade Korea, which was not exactly the first or the last time they'd attempted this particular manoeuvre, decided to use secret agents to instigate a plot to remove Admiral Yi. And in this, they were successful. And then the Korean government decided that they were going to put Admiral Won Gyung in charge of the Navy. Um, now, perhaps the fact that earlier on in the Japanese invasion, Admiral, now Admiral Won Gyung's most remarkable feat had been to scuttle most of his ships so they wouldn't be captured after failing to actually defeat a Japanese fleet and then calling for Admiral Yi's help to help rescue his remaining ships. So 
yeah, not necessarily the world's best naval commander already. And he then spent most of the remaining period as a general on land, where at least he couldn't scuttle his forces. But, um, well, he was now in command of the Korean Navy, and some of the rumours that the Japanese had used to trick the Koreans into relieving Admiral Yi, i.e. that the Japanese were going to invade and therefore the Koreans should definitely, definitely sail out and attack various islands and so forth before the Japanese fleet could get to them, well, to his credit, Admiral Won Gyung did actually understand that, you know, this was not really something he should be doing either. But unlike Admiral Yi, who had basically dug his heels in and refused to go after the obvious bait, Admiral Won Gyung eventually ended up going for said bait with his relatively small Korean fleet, came across a much larger Japanese fleet, just as the Japanese had intended, and then instead of doing the relatively smart thing of, you know, pulling back from the obvious trap, he decided to engage them. That went back and forth for a bit. It was a little bit indecisive, but the Japanese won the battle overall, at which point Admiral Wong Gyung retreated back into a strait. Now, retreating back into a strait where you could constrain the numbers of Japanese ships was a tactic that Admiral Yi had used on several occasions to great success. However, Admiral Yi had, one, not demoralised and, you know, completely trashed his fleet by engaging the Japanese in open waters first, and secondly, Admiral Yi knew that in any situation, if you sat there for long enough, the enemy would figure out what you were doing, and once they figured out what you were doing, they would come up with some kind of countermeasure to you, and therefore, when he encountered the Japanese fleet, in pre-prepared situations that he'd set up, he hit them hard, he hit them fast, and he won. Whereas Admiral Wong Gyung basically had read the Cliff Notes version of Admiral Yi's tactics, took his remaining ships into a strait, sat there, and refused to do anything, or indeed actually see anyone. He just retreated back into his cabin and waited for the Japanese to show up. The Japanese fleet duly showed up, went, hmm, this is interesting, I wonder if we have some time to do some reconnaissance. Found they had all the time in the world, did plenty of reconnaissance, landed troops, planned everything to a T, and then swept down and destroyed pretty much the entirety of the Korean fleet. Uh, in a rare instance of actually this being a full-on naval Darwin award, Admiral Wong Gyung made it ashore, but then decided to just wait for the Japanese to kill him, which they did. This battle was pretty much one of the main catalysts for the legend of Admiral Yi. Not that he wasn't already legendary up till this point, but that he then had to be recalled, you know, as the only remaining decent admiral that the Koreans could think of, and he had to start not even over again compared to where he'd started before, he had to start basically from scratch, but still managed to beat the Japanese fleet. So Admiral Yi became much, much more famous, but uh, thanks to Admiral Won Gyung's incompetence in large part. Next, uh, we introduce you to Admiral Plumridge, of the Crimean War, and as the name might suggest, he was part of the Royal Navy. Now, to set the scene, at the beginning of the Crimean War, the government wrote to the Admiralty as follows. It is Her Majesty's anxious desire that the interests of humanity should be regarded in the war upon which Great Britain has now entered, to the fullest extent which its operations will admit, and I am to request your lordships to give positive orders to Sir Charles Napier to respect private property wherever it can be spared, without a sacrifice of the objects of war, and on no account to attack defenceless places and open towns. Somehow, this message does not appear to have been passed down to Rear Admiral James Hanway Plumridge, who had been put in command of a squadron of steam-powered vessels and had been ordered to reconnoitre the Aland Islands and blockade the area in that vicinity. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the geography of Northern Europe, you'll realise the Aland Islands are now part of Finland, and indeed at the time they were also part of Finland, it's just that at the time Finland was not an independent country, they were the Grand Duchy of Finland, and connected obviously to Russia, who had taken them over some time earlier. Nonetheless, to say that the Finns were not exactly the world's greatest fans of the Russians would be putting it mildly, and thus it comes as something of a surprise to those who have, you know, some form of level-headedness, 
that Plumridge decided the single best way of you know dealing with the situation was to launch a series of almost Viking style attacks on various Finnish ports and settlements. If he saw a vessel at sea, then he just seized it, regardless of the fact that most of the vessels were private vessels owned by the local farmers and traders, not Russian commercial or war vessels. And he started to burn tens of thousands of barrels of pitch and tar, burning also huge stocks of seasoned timbers, masts, spars, planks, sails, ropes, and other forms of naval stores. Now, you might think, well, surely he's depriving the Russian Navy of lots of valuable equipment, so surely this is good. Uh, no. You see, as I said, the Finns were not the world's greatest fans of the Russians, and whilst Russia and Britain were at war, and as I said, Finland was technically part of Russia, pretty much all of the material that Plumridge destroyed was material that was bound for Britain. In a lot of cases, it had already been paid for, by British merchants who were bringing in to supply the Royal Navy and was being stored in warehouses until the fog and the ice could clear a little bit better to allow trading to be done a little bit more safely. So what Plumridge was actually doing was shooting up the homes of British allies, burning supplies that were destined for the Royal Navy, and not only that, but also burning supplies that had in large part already been paid for by the Royal Navy. To the point that a number of British firms started applying for compensation from the Admiralty because they said, well, you've just gone and burned stuff that is ours and, you know, we're a British firm. We're not on the other side of this war. What the heck are you doing? Uh, not to mention there was quite an understandable upsurge in anti-British sentiment from the formerly largely friendly Finnish community. So all in all, Admiral Plumridge managed to cause huge financial loss in Britain, huge amounts of embarrassment for the government, huge amounts of financial and material loss for the Admiralty, and turn at what was formerly a vaguely neutral, if not friendly, coastline into a hostile one. Yeah, not exactly the world's smartest cookie, really. Next, we travel a little bit south and a bit further forward in time to February 1940 where the first German destroyer flotilla, a total of six destroyers, set out to intercept and destroy British shipping as best they could. The night was somewhat foggy, gave them plenty of visual cover, so it seemed like it'd be a fairly simple operation. They were told that there would be Luftwaffe aerial reconnaissance to cover their departure and return to make sure they weren't ambushed when they were least expecting it, and they were also given a signal that bomber forces would also be at readiness. Uh, they weren't entirely sure what that meant, considering it was going to be a night operation, and, well, let's just say day bombing operations by both sides hadn't had the world's highest level of accuracy at this point, so quite what a night bomber strike would do to mo moving ships stuck in fog banks was, well, questionable at best, but if anything was to be gleaned from the signal, they took it to mean that there would be a bunch of bomber squadrons who would be happy to chance their luck should they call for help. And, of course, they didn't think they were going to need to. Meanwhile, over on the Luftwaffe side, they would had been planning an anti-shipping strike mission for a little while, but it had been delayed. And this night they decided, well, it's now time to launch our mission. Somewhere in the cross lines of communication between Goering's division of the German armed forces and Reda's, the signals got a little bit mixed and a little bit lost, such that the Luftwaffe forces were not informed at all that the Kriegsmarine was out there, and the Kriegsmarine, as we've just seen, was not told that Luftwaffe bomber forces would actually be out there doing their own thing. And so, in the evening, aboard the destroyer Friedrich Eckholt, they heard an aircraft overhead. Well, this was a little bit odd, but, um, you know, it might be a random reconnaissance plane that's got slightly lost. So they tried to see if it had Luftwaffe markings. But the aircraft, despite obviously seeing them, had made no effort to actually identify itself. Then a few destroyers, concluding that if it wasn't going to identify itself, it must be hostile, fired a few shots at it. The plane returned fire with one of its machine guns, and so both sides concluded that clearly the other side was a hostile. Uh, the plane looped back round, 
And as it did so, one of the lookouts, or one of the destroyers, saw German symbols on the side and said, hey, no, you know, this is actually one of our bombers. But everybody else was a little bit hyped up by having been shot at and thought maybe he was the one who made the mistake. And of course, aboard Friedrich Eckholt, uh, Command Commander Fritz Berger was convinced that, well, if Luftwaffe bombers were going to be operating in the same area as his destroyers, surely he would have been told. So... It had to be a hostile aircraft. This was only reinforced when, a few minutes later, the destroyer Lebrecht Maas radioed that, well, that plane was back again, dropping out of the clouds, and just as she was making that report, there was a rather loud couple of explosions. Uh, the aircraft had just dropped a couple of bombs and had hit Lebrecht Maas amidships. The destroyer promptly began to sink. The other German destroyers promptly closed in on the their stricken colleague, and began lowering boats to try and rescue the survivors, at which point somebody on one of the ships decided they could hear submarines on their hydrophones, which sent everybody into something of a panic. The destroyer Theodore Redl immediately launched depth charges, but forgot that, you know, when you're launching depth charges, you have to be moving relatively quickly. Bear in mind, they had slowed down to try and pick up survivors, and so instead of destroying any notional submarines, the main accomplishment of the depth charges was to break the Theodore Redl's rudder, leaving it slowed and st steaming around in circles. Of course, the sound of depth charges being launched, followed by a rather large plume of water at Theodore Redl's stern, convinced everybody that, yes, indeed, there must be submarines in the area, because, well, obviously, the Theodore Redl had dropped depth charges on the sub, and the sub had responded with a torpedo. So everybody else started sailing around dropping depth charges, and in the waters, in the confusion caused by the darkness, the water plumes thrown up by the various bow waves convinced everybody that they were spotting periscopes and torpedo wakes when in fact what they were seeing was just the bow and stern wakes of other destroyers who were equally thinking that they could see incoming submarines somebody said oh i've spotted a conning tower one of the destroyers that was a bit close decided right i will ram it and then at the very last minute noticed that what they'd actually spotted was the bow section of the lebrecht mars which was in the process of sinking uh, meanwhile, back on Frederick Eckholt, they were incredibly confused because they were running in the opposite direction from the Liebrecht Mars and appeared to have just come across the Liebrecht Mars, which confused everybody very greatly because, you know, they're not that quick at circumnavigating the planet. It turned out that this other sinking destroyer was in fact the Max Schultz, which had been hit by something, no one knew quite what at the time, it was probably a mine, and was also in the process of sinking. Now thoroughly convinced that they must be in the middle of a British wolf pack of submarines, the destroyers all made haste back home, unfortunately leaving a huge number of survivors in the water, and as it turned out that, that there would only be 60 survivors from Lebrecht Mars and nobody who survived from the Max Schultz. All of this confusion and loss caused by a single Heinkel 111 that had gone lost from the Luftwaffe patrols and the British had been nowhere in sight. In fact, the British had no idea that anything had happened until quite some time later. Going back across the channel to the UK and travelling back in time, we go to the voyage of Anson. Now, he would become quite famous. Obviously, HMS Anson, the King George V class battleship of World War II fame, was named after him, and generally Anson's voyages rim remembered as quite a remarkable success. After all, he did manage to circumnavigate the world, which was pretty rare in those days. He managed to survive said circumnavigation, which was even rarer, and he came back with an absolute fortune in silver, having captured the Spanish Manila Galleon, all of which is true. However, he started off with six warships and two merchant ships, and finished the voyage with one warship, which had a grand total amalgamated crew of 188. Given that the mission had set out with almost 2,000 men, that would have represented about a 90% casualty rate if it wasn't for the fact that about 300 others had survived on three ships that had turned back much earlier in the voyage. Now, the funny thing is that the vast, 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 vast majority of those losses were not down to enemy action or even the weather. They were down purely to the incompetence of the Admiralty at the time. They'd struggled to find enough men to crew Anson's squadron, 
in the first place, and when their initial crewing efforts had failed, they decided that the marine complement would be made up of 500 men, and this would be supplied by the Chelsea pensioners. And if the clue wasn't already in the name, yes, the Chelsea pensioners, the inhabitants of the Chelsea Hospital in London, which existed at the time, were a bunch of overaged ex-marines and other sailors who had ended up there because they'd been invalided out of service so badly they couldn't reasonably be expected to support themselves in day-to-day -day life in the London of the 1700s. Once they found out what was going on, bearing in mind they were this bunch of crippled old age pensioners was being asked to march from London to Portsmouth, anyone who had any form of mobility really at all decided to desert, um, so only about 250 of the original 500 actually arrived. The level of corruption in the supply department of the Admiralty was so bad that basically all the food that had been provided to the squadron was rotten by the time they got to the South Atlantic, and thus, as you might expect, scurvy took place aboard the ships in, in massive, massive amounts, and of course with scurvy's weakening of everybody's immune systems, all sorts of other horrific diseases began to break out as well. In fact, the entire voyage basically reads as practically everybody got sick, there were about a dozen men left aboard who could actually sail the ship, and we were probably all going to die until we managed to find somewhere where we could fortunately go ashore, eat some fruit, and vegetables and other fresh foods that, you know, weren't horrifically rotten and mouldy, which mysteriously, magically, made most people better, except for the ones that were too far gone, and then we stocked up and sailed off, and then the same thing happened again and again and again as ships and men began to die. Oh, and on top of it, just in case scurvy hat did break out, the Admiralty had been persuaded to equip the ships with a last-ditch remedy by one Dr. Ward uh, in pill form, which was supposed to uh, stave off the worst effects of scurvy, but appears to have been a cross between poison and a diuretic, which, as you might imagine, made things actively worse. So essentially, the main highlight of Anson's voyage was the miracle that anybody made it back at all, considering that the Admiralty had done the next best thing to actively sabotaging the voyage from the moment it set out. Now, the next one is a little bit controversial because there are multiple versions of exactly what happened and why that are available. So let's introduce our main character, uh, Jean II, Comte d'Estrier, um, which is Jean, the Count of Destrier, wherever that happens to be. Anyway, he is a Frenchman, if the name hadn't given it away. And up until this point, he was actually a relatively successful naval commander. Um, partly because, well, as a fairly high-ranking aristocrat, he managed to get a lot of fairly plum assignments. He had some fairly powerful patrons up in the French court. But for all that, as I said, he seemed to do relatively well for himself. Um, in the Franco-Dutch War, he managed to fight either as part of or in charge of a number of French fleets that did relatively well for themselves. And then he also managed to capture three Dutch islands and destroy a Dutch fleet in the Caribbean. Then we come to the main event, the attack on Curaçao. Uh, unfortunately, it would turn out to be something of a damp squib. According to uh, de Estrier himself, when he submitted his report, which, uh, shockingly enough, exonerated himself completely, um, the pilots that he hired for his fleet were completely incompetent, were unable to agree where they were, and therefore the fleet had no idea where they were. And Again, according to him, he sent three privateers ahead of him, his fleet just in case the pilots magically somehow developed an inability to steer the ships. But the privateers, being lighter draft ships than full-on warships, had gone straight over a reef without noticing it, and then the rest of the fleet ran onto it. The captain of Destrier's flagship, the Terrible, however, had something of a different version of events to tell. According to him, uh, Destrier basically didn't pay any attention to any subordinates at all. 
and fancied himself something of a navigator, dismissing the pilots as incompetent and not knowing what they were doing, which is one of the very, very few things that both Destrier's account and his captain's account actually agree on. But he apparently, again according to the captain's report, decided that the best way of approaching Curaçao and navigating in general was to follow a latitude and use his own personal dead reckoning to work out how far along that latitude had they'd gone, and when they'd gone far enough as far as he was concerned, he would just turn the fleet south and hopefully arrive at Curaçao. In theory, if you were travelling short distances with coasts in sight, this was a perfectly logical way of doing things, if somewhat dated, and might, if true, explain why he hadn't had any problems fighting in the English Channel on the North Sea. In this case, however, the fleet turned and ran headlong into a massive reef. That claimed 12 French warships, the entire fleet that he'd gone out with, including seven whole ships of the line, and pretty much all that they could do was hope that the privateers that were with them could remove some of the crews safely. Now, the captain's report did mention that one of the privateers did fire a signal gun, basically saying, oh, look out, there's a reef ahead, but according to him, Destrier uh, basically didn't pay any attention to that either. There was a rather interesting footnote to all of this, which was that another French fleet sent out with somewhat better navigators did manage to salvage quite a lot of the cannon and shot from the wrecked ships since they were stuck on reefs and therefore it wasn't exactly a deep dive to go and recover all of the equipment. But if the captain's version is true, then uh, Destrier, the navigator, <laughs> would quite easily win a naval Darwin Award. Uh, of course, if you believe Destrier's own account, then he had nothing to do with it. Well, make up your own decision, I guess. Now, we have already talked at length about the Mark 14 torpedo. There's an entire video on it, and it has extensive reference in a number of other videos. So we're going to talk about the other big torpedo scandal of World War II that is perhaps somewhat less known. And, uh, well, the villain of this particular piece is Oscar Wehr, who was in charge of the development of German torpedoes. Now, another incident that most people have heard of is the sinking of the battleship Royal Oak in Scapa Flow. I, obviously, for reasons that most of you know, am very aware of that particular incident. But what people are perhaps not always so familiar with when it comes to that particular attack is that U-47 was somewhat lucky to make the strike that she did. Not in terms of whether or not there was any significant level of skill involved in getting into Scapa Flow. There certainly was. But... Um, well, initially, U-47 fired quite a lot of torpedoes at Royal Oak and did nothing. Basically, all that he'd managed to do was bounce one off of the anchor chain. He then had to go back, reload, and fire another bunch of torpedoes at Royal Oak. And it would be these that eventually sent the ship to the bottom. Now, why had he had to fire so many of his torpedoes to sink a single battleship that had no idea he was there and indeed was completely stationary? Well, this wasn't the first time U-boats had had problems with their torpedoes in the first year of the war. Less than two weeks into the war, U-39 had managed to penetrate the destroyer screen around the aircraft carrier HMS Royal Oak and had fired two torpedoes from under a thousand yards away. But instead of slamming home, both torpedoes detonated about 100 yards away from the carrier. Everyone turned around and went, oh look, there's a bubble trail leading right back to a point in the ocean. The destroyers immediately turned around, depth charged the U-39, forced it to the surface, and took the crew prisoner. Less than a week later, U-27 basically had the same thing happen to it, when it fired a bunch of torpedoes, and they also prematurely detonated, and everybody swarmed on that. Then, of course, you had U-47's attack in Scapa Flow, and two weeks after that, U-56 had an even better opportunity when it got the drop on HMS Nelson. They fired three torpedoes, dived to wait for the inevitable explosions, because again, point-blank range, and were rewarded with two loud clangs, as two torpedoes did in fact hit HMS Nelson, 
and just smashed into the side and then sank in bits to the ocean floor. And the reports just kept coming in. Two submarines between them fired no less than 11 torpedoes in the space of two days, every single one of which failed to function. And as covered in the video that I did on the Battle of Narvik, well, the three battles of Narvik, a number of German U-boats took pot shots at HMS Warspite, and none of their torpedoes worked either. And then as part of the Norway campaign, U-47 found itself in a fjord with a cruiser and three troop ships, all loaded with troops. Preen loaded his four forward torpedo tubes, fired off four torpedoes. Nothing happened. He went down, he inspected four new torpedoes personally, loaded them up, fired them all off. Nothing happened, and then a few minutes later the side of the, the fjord got a small impact from a torpedo which did in fact explode. Well, let's just say nobody was very happy with this, and Admiral Dönitz, who was of course in charge of the submarine divisions, decided to look into it. And he discovered that Oscar Wehr, the head of the Torpedo Developments Division, had not actually ever tested the percussion fuse that was fitted to German torpedoes. It had been invented in 1928 and had literally never been tested since. Nor had he tested the magnetic fuse in anything other than the Baltic. And as those of you who have seen the Mark 14 video will know, there were quite a few issues with early war magnetic detonators, not least of which was the fact that they, a lot, in most cases, failed to account for the fact that the Earth's magnetic field varies in intensity. So if you calibrate a magnetic detonator to work only in the magnetic patterns of the southern Baltic, and then you start firing them in the high areas of the North Sea or the southern areas of the Arctic Ocean, where the Earth's magnetic field influence is considerably stronger, you get a bunch of premature detonations. Also, in shades of what was happening with the Mark 14, when they subsequently did actually test the torpedoes, they found that most of them ran about 10 foot deeper than they were supposed to, a problem which also plagued the German surface units and had been something of a thorn in the side of the German destroyers in the second battle of Narvik. Now, the flip side to that was that it didn't take the Germans anywhere near as long as it took the Bureau of Ordnance to admit that there was a problem and correct it once they were aware of it, but still, as that short and incomplete listing of all the different targets that were engaged in the early part of the war might show, the German U-boats could have had a much, much higher, much more significant kill count than they historically did. And finally, we travel back to ancient times for the wonderful Battle of Drepana, or Drepanum, depending on which source you read. Now, this was during one of the several Punic Wars against the Carthaginians, waged by the Roman state. And, well, it started off with somebody deciding that Publius Claudius Pulcher, who was one of the two consuls for that year, would make an excellent leader for the Roman fleet, because he was a politician who'd managed to get elected and had some experience fighting on land. And um, yeah, that this was probably the first mistake, but possibly, you might argue, not necessarily the worst mistake, because, well, at this point the Romans were using the Corvus, and they were treating sea battles as pretty much land battles with an additional chance of drowning, so perhaps uh, Claudius Pulcher's little experience fighting on land might have some relevance. Unfortunately, uh, Claudius Pulcher appears to have decided that it was literally a land battle, and thus he positioned himself and his flagship at the rear of the Roman fleet, which had become somewhat disordered as it tried to sail through the night, basically to do what a land commander would do, which is hustle along those who were falling behind. And with the Roman fleet somewhat strung out from its nighttime inability to keep formation, it meant that the forwardmost elements of the Roman fleet were several miles ahead of the rearmost and could not really receive any orders from the rear of the fleet, considering that at this stage in history orders had to be relayed by literally people shouting at each other since the flag signal system that we see in the Age of Sail had yet to be invented. The Carthaginian fleet was happily harbouring at Drepana and saw the Romans coming. They were ready for sea, but there was a chance that they were going to be closed in, so they rapidly began to sail out. 
Now, according to some accounts, the traditional omen taking with sacred chickens was done, and they didn't eat, which was seen as a sign of disaster, and Pulcher just decided they should be chucked overboard. So if you've ever heard about a Roman admiral who decided the sacred chickens just needed to be drowned because they weren't telling him what they wanted, this battle is the origin of that, if that account is actually true. Um, there is some dispute as to whether or not that bit actually happened, but what happened next certainly was true. With Pulcher all the way at the back of the fleet, the first elements of the Roman fleet, who had been under orders from the previous day that, you know, we're going to sail into the harbour and attack the Carthaginians, continued into the harbour to attack the Carthaginians. Unfortunately, the harbour had a fairly narrow entrance and the Carthaginians had all left. But, well, the Romans were going to say, orders are orders, off we go. Um, Pulcher, by this point, to his credit, had actually noticed what was going on and tried to send a faster vessel ahead to tell the leading elements of his fleet, no, don't go in there, we have a battle to fight over here. Which resulted in some of the leading elements of the fleet hearing the message and other elements not hearing the message after the delay that the fast ship took getting from the back of the fleet to the front of the fleet which now meant in the tight confines of the entrance of the harbour, some elements of the Roman fleet were turning around and trying to go back the other way. Other elements were continuing on into the now pretty much empty harbour. And then the middle part of the Roman formation, which the speeding messenger ship has apparently not bothered to tell anything to, started to enter as well. And everybody was soon yelling at each other, no, the, the consul says we need to go back out to sea. And others were saying, well, no one's told us that, so we're going back in. At which point the lead and middle elements of the Roman fleet began to run into each other and strip it themselves of their own oars and generally cause a massive logjam. At which point the Carthaginians just sat outside and, well... In the spirit of Sun Tzu, who had actually died about 200 years earlier, but to be fair, they probably never ever heard of, they decided not to interrupt the enemy while they were making a mistake and watch the Romans dogpile themselves into oblivion. As the Roman fleet began to finally sort itself out, the Carthaginians launched an attack from seaward, which left the Romans in a bit of a difficult position because the Carthaginian ships were the better sailors and the now bunched up Romans faced a bit of a quandary. If a Carthaginian ship got into trouble, it could simply back its oars and reverse back out to sea to the support of its fellows. And if a Roman ship tried to pursue it, then it would be mobbed by Carthaginian vessels. Conversely, if a Roman ship got itself into trouble, it couldn't reverse because reversing would mean smashing into the shoreline. And with, as said, the Carthaginians being better sailors and having somewhat more handy and swifter vessels, they were able to just pick off elements of the Roman fleet that were at the edges of the gradually shrinking Roman formation. Now, to be fair to the Roman fleet, the fact that they were stuffed full of legionaries meant that they were actually very difficult to deal with in a boarding action, hence why the gradually increasingly numerically superior Carthaginians were still being forced to pick up off and mob ships at the edge of the formation or just rely on ramming rather than straight up boarding. But as more and more Roman ships fell, the numbers began to be stacked more and more against the Romans, and sooner or later, Roman morale collapsed, the fleet broke up, and the remaining ships were mostly run down and captured. Uh, Pulcher managed to escape with 30 ships, but at least 93 Roman vessels were lost. And when we say 93 vessels were lost, that's 93 captured by the Carthaginians, plus the 30 that escaped, plus an unknown but probably large number that actually sank because, as I said in this battle, the Carthaginians resorted to ramming tactics in order to sink vessels, perhaps a bit more than was common for naval battles around about this time. And that's how a Roman consul managed to lose almost all of his fleet in the midst of a war where the Romans generally were actually rather decisively winning many of the naval engagements. And that wraps up this little collection of various incidents of naval stupidity. Now, of course, you may ask, well, there's surely a bunch more. Yeah, oh, <laughs> the history of uh, naval warfare is littered with examples of colossal stupidity, and some of the ones that aren't here have been covered elsewhere on the channel, which is why I haven't included them here. You know, HMS Captain, uh, Mark 14 Torpedo, as we've mentioned already, etc., etc. So... If there are other incidents you think should be covered, well, mention them in the comments below and tell us why you think they or 
the officers involved are particularly silly. And if there's others you think are really, really obvious, like, say, the sinking of Abakir, Hogue, and Cressy, well, the reason they're not in this is, again, because they kind of merit their own videos. In any case, thanks very much for listening. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.